Recording started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our December Partners in Care Roundtable for the End Disparities Learning Exchange. Today we'll be talking about working alongside providers, and this discussion is intended for consumers to find out how best to engage with their providers if they'd wish to get involved in this work, and for providers a little sense of what type of personality traits and what characteristics you might be looking for in a consumer um, if you are looking to engage with consumers in this work um, in a coordinated fashion. My name is Michael Hager. I'm the Manager of Technical Assistance at the National Quality Center, and I'm the lead for the End Disparities Learning Exchange. And on the call today, I have with me Dolores Stockery, our peer consultant for the National Quality Center, who's helping us to lead this event and consumer involvement. And also Amir Simon, one of our End Disparities Learning Exchange spokespeople, who represents the MSM of color uh, population of focus. On behalf of the National Quality Center, we're really pleased to offer Partners in Care Roundtables, again, as a way to involve consumers in this really important work of ending disparities in HIV care. So we have a relatively intimate group. Um, I think uh, one of the things that we normally do is have people enter their name in the chat room, but uh, we can quickly go through and um, say a little bit about who we are and um, what we are trying to do if we're um, more looking as a service provider trying to engage consumers or if we're a consumer or ally trying to become engaged in this work. So, um, Anam, um, why don't you say a little bit about uh, where you're calling from and um, your focus for today. Hi, uh, this is Anam. I am a quality management coordinator at the REACH program and our focus mainly here is to try to involve more consumers into our program and be more involved. Thanks. Welcome, Anam. Chuck. Hi, my name is Chuck Baritim. I'm new to Hub, and I'm taking over Emily's position. So I'm um, in week four and still in the learning process. And I want to thank everyone at NQC. They've been very, very great for helpful in transitioning me into this role. Thank you. Thanks so much, Shep. Uh, Chuck Kolasar. Hey, good morning, everybody. It's Chuck Holasar from Memphis. I'm the program and quality manager here at uh, Ryan White Part A. Um, and what we're doing right now is working on uh, developing a consumer advocacy board uh, with the intention of having the board really help us to um, kind of guide and direct our quality management program. Great. Thanks, Chuck, and welcome. Uh, Robert. Yeah, uh, this is Robert Robo. I'm um, um, recent hire, well, well, transferred from the uh, small rural county in, in the state of Florida where we had consumers involved in our uh, QAQI process into a much larger, we have 24 sites around the state. To, and I guess today's, mm, what I'm trying to get out is to see how we're going to try to involve consumers in QAQI, whether it's a cab or, or um, through actual being with the on the committees. I am the QAQI specialist, recently hired August 1st. Welcome, Robert, and thanks so much. Of, oh. of Florida. Great. Thanks so much for joining us. And um, I just put a little note in the chat room for folks who are joining us um, just to provide a little bit of information about them in the chat room um, as we get going. Um, I'll go ahead and move to the next slide. Welcome, Christine. On today's webinar, we um, encourage you to act, uh, um, actively participate in the discussion. Um, we're an intimate group, so I'm not going to go ahead and mute all lines. However, if there's um, any disruption or, you know, some on-hold music coming from um, any one line, I will go ahead and mute it. You can find the mute button to the right of your name um, or to the right of your phone number where it says guest there is a little orange button that you can press to mute and unmute your line at any time. If I've muted your line, you can go ahead and unmute it um, when it's time for you to ask questions or to interact with us. Of course, you can also feel free to make use of our chat room and to make observations or comments about the presentation or ask questions there as we are moving through. Um, we ask that you avoid putting us on hold because a lot of folks have some groovy on hold music which um, could serve as a distraction for those of us who are trying to listen into the discussion as we work our way through the presentation today. Um, we have a uh, recording um, for this webinar that's going to be posted on the website by the end of the day today. 
You can access recording for any of our previous uh, webinars, office hours, or partners and care roundtables by going to enddisparitiesexchange.org and by clicking uh, resources and then informational slide sets. You can also access it by going through our calendar and finding all the materials for our webinars attached to the meeting um, announcement that is in the calendar. Um, one thing that um, I should note is that the National Quality Center does have a Twitter um, and a fan page. Um, for uh, future presentations, we'll be including those handles here, but um, what uh, the handles are, let me just make sure that I'm getting this right, our handle for Twitter is NATL Quality CTR. I'm going to just go ahead and put that in the chat room. And our Facebook is, um, I believe, also NATL Quality CTR, but let me also make sure that I get that right. Uh, it's Facebook.com National Quality Center. Um, we have all kinds of announcements that we post on our uh, social media, and it's another opportunity to engage with other providers like you to um, ask questions and, and just engage on the subject matter of clinical quality management um, as it relates to any of the topics of focus for the National Quality Center. So um, at this time, um, I'd like to uh, make some words of welcome on behalf of the National Quality Center. Our director, Clemens Steinbach, is out of the office at a site visit today. Um, the National Quality Center warmly welcomes all of you, um, and for those of you listening uh, to this recording, um, welcomes you as well. Um, the End Disparities Learning Exchange is a big effort to tackle the issues surrounding disparities in HIV health outcomes, and we wouldn't be able to do this work uh, without any of you in the field. And we really um, thank you uh, and value um, your passion and your commitment to all people living with HIV and in trying to make a dent in ending disparities in HIV health outcomes. Shep uh, Maritim is our uh, project officer with the HIV AIDS Bureau, and she introduced herself before, but um, Shep, I don't know if you want to provide any words of welcome um, as we get going today as well. So, Michael, I just want to say again, I'm new to the process. I'm really, um, I'm really thrilled to be part of the team. I've had a ton of good stuff on what NQC has been doing uh, for the community, and I just cannot wait to learn more about the process, and we continue to work together as a team. Thank you so much. Fabulous. Thank you, Shep. So for those of you who are less familiar, the End Disparities Learning Exchange is a nine-month initiative that promotes application of improvement interventions to reduce HIV-related disparities in four key subpopulations, all while building and sustaining a community of learners among Ryan White HIV AIDS program recipients. The Learning Exchange offers informational opportunities like this one um, that is looking at consumer involvement in particular, but also offers um, educational opportunities for um, folks generally to think about disparities in HIV care. And also we offer office hours, which is an informal opportunity to interface with other providers, um, with coaches and with consumers around key areas um, of focus for this initiative. You can find information about all of these uh, opportunities on our website, enddisparitiesexchange.org, by clicking Events. Uh, the National Quality Center offers a number of different services. Um, our communities of learning, uh, like this one, the End Disparities Learning Exchange, is one of the higher levels of engagement that we have with you, the Ryan White HIV AIDS Program community, um, providers, and consumers. But we have another, uh, a number of other opportunities as well, including face-to-face on-site um, consultation with one of our uh, TA coaches. We have um, uh, the Quality Academy, which is a training module, um, not unlike um, the IHI Academy that is available free for free on our website, nationalqualitycenter.org. And we have many, many publications um, available to help you consider clinical quality management in your own program at your site, available on our website as well, nationalqualitycenter.org. So uh, I, my name is Dolores Dockery, and I'm your lead consumer uh, for the N Plus Disparities campaign, and uh, will be one of your co-facilitators today. Uh, our agenda today, um, first we, we did the welcome and introduction. We will review partner N Plus care roles um, and really try to engage providers um, as they try to increase consumer involvement. 
and take action as a partner in care. Uh, what are some of the actions that needs to be taken? And then we'll have a, a robust question and answer section. So our learning objective today is to name the three partner in care uh, roles people with HIV can utilize to interact with uh, Ryan White HIV AIDS uh, providers, program providers in working on disparities. And uh, the next objective is really to identify common strategies people with HIV can employ to engage Ryan White HIV AIDS program providers and other consumers as partners in care to become actively involved in trying to end disparities in HIV care. So let's look at the Partner in Plus Care framework, revisiting some of the roles. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Amir Simon, and Hello. I represent the MSM of color of uh, members living with HIV. So the roles in um, will be the mentors. They support themselves and others in improving health through self-management and regular medical visits. <clears throat> the ambassadors share their personal success stories and clinical program information related to retention and viral suppression. Um, the architects, they help design and implement quality improvement projects which focus on improving retention and viral suppression. <clears throat> and we've, we've presented this information before, but I think the reason, Amir, that we want to share this, um, it sounds like these three different roles capture three different types of personalities and three different sets of, um, I guess, interest or passion um, that folks might have as people living with HIV who want to get involved in this work. Would you say that's a fair assessment? Yes. Cool. So, for an example, the, the mentor, you will want to support others in one-on-one -on -one support, relationship and retention and self-management. You may be supporting your friends <clears throat> with adherence, navigation, or just, you know, making it to the next visit. The ambassador, you will want to share your personal and positive experience you have had with your clinic's retention and viral suppression programs to help others to better engage. The architect, you know a lot about quality improvement in HIV care and are willing to learn more and want to be involved in designing and implementing quality improvement projects. And those roles have um, a lot of different uh, subcomponents, and it might make some people scratch their head and say, hey, where do I start? Um, one thing the National Quality Center is doing um, is putting together toolkits that will be available on the enddisparitiesexchange.org website underneath the Partners in Care header. And these toolkits will have a number of examples and different opportunities for individuals to engage in each of these roles and help them understand, well, what does it take to be a mentor or an ambassador or an architect? And what types of resources do I have available if I wish to get involved um, in any of these different ways? And I think one of the interesting things that we've talked about a lot is that the unique role of each of the, the, the different um, roles. The mentor is a one-to-one -one relationship. How are you a good peer? Uh, to, to in a one-to-one -one situation, while the ambassador is, you know, talking to more people, um, willing to share your stories in a larger forum. And then the architect, as somebody mentioned here, they're looking for CAB members or advisory board member. That, that might be the architect who wants to be involved in planning and implementing programs. Great. So out of the three roles, which would you consider, you know, yourself to be in this campaign? Well, 
for me, Dolores, I am definitely in, in, in the architect role. I, I am a member of a quality improvement committee where I am um, in my EMA. And um, this is Michael. Um, I consider myself an architect being involved in setting up these, um, these initiatives and in working with folks around the country in terms of thinking about um, how to operationalize or systematize clinical quality management programs and quality improvement. But I've also been an ambassador over time um, because all the great work that you do, I want to make sure that it gets out there. So the social media posts that we do, um, some of the blogging that we do, the newsletters that we write, um, and presentations that we make elsewhere, um, whether it's a conference or, um, you know, at a training, I consider myself to be an ambassador as well. And some of you may know this, but um, I uh, lead a group called Positive Alliance, which is a social organization for um, gay men living with HIV around the United States. Um, and so I consider myself to be a mentor as well, because individuals living with HIV um, approach me all the time to ask questions about how to approach their doctor with a certain question or feeling uneasy about new treatment or feeling, um, you know, vulnerable or iffy about going to um, a mental health provider or someone. And, you know, my role there is one-on-one, -on -one, as um, Dolores had said, saying that, you know, hey, you know, if, if – if you feel depressed, it's a good thing to go to a mental health provider. And, you know, if you have questions or concerns or if you don't, if you don't feel right about what's happening, you should, you know, talk to other peers and to get their sense of, you know, what their experience has been. So, you know, I really consider myself with my history um, as having been in all three roles in the past. Does anyone Michael, else on the call want to share? This is Judy. I just have a question for Positive Alliance. How do you congregate or how do you get those referrals for people that you would like to mentor or help in any way? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we have individual communities within um, individual community groups in cities um, and regions across the country. Um, and so we work primarily through those individual communities um, and we have groups in New York, D.C., Boston, uh, Philadelphia, Dallas, and Denver, um, and we're always looking to create new communities um, as well. And so if anyone has any questions about that, um, you know, you can email me, michael at nationalqualitycenter.org. Um, it sounds as though a lot of the folks on the line today come from communities that don't yet have um, one of these organizations um, or groups set up yet. So, you know, I'm always happy to think about that. Um, you know, it's an all-volunteer activity, so, um, and I don't want to steal too much thunder from my day job here, but I was just trying to provide an example. Um, but thank you very much for that question, or I'll put my email here in the bottom. Well, I think one of the key points you raised, Michael, is that all of us at some time in our life might fit into any one of these categories. and. Um, it is just what role we want to play in in our clinic setting as we work on quality management and quality improvement. Yeah. Yeah, and from the provider side to think about, you know, the, the wonderful interpersonal relationships that you have with your patients um, and with your clients and the people that you serve generally. You know, I'm sure that there are some people who stand out as real hams and, you know, socializers who want to stand up on stage and to be that ambassador. Or people who are very technical in mind frame um, and knowledgeable about um, HIV care and about systems of care might want to be that architect. Or you might know people who are really great with one-to-one -one interpersonal relationships who are really looking to give back more. The idea here is to just think about what opportunities you have within your own groups of patients that you serve um, and how you can leverage those passions and interests um, and really um, help consumers to become involved in this work. So it's a two-way fence. Consumers can self-identify and say, I'm interested in this work. Or providers can find someone who has expressed wanting to become greater involved um, and saying, hey, did you know that there's um, these uh, tools and these resources available through um, the National Quality Center and the End Disparities Learning Exchange? Amir, why don't you tell us a little bit about the general toolkit as something to um, help people to um, acclimate generally? 
Um, sorry, hold on. Yeah, we are on slide 12. Okay. So the general toolkit, all partners in care have access to the basic toolkit to complete the tools and resources that are needed by all partners. The general toolkit includes presentations, templates on the topic of retention and viral suppression with customizable options for local presentations, basics of HIV care, retention and viral suppression information, the continuum of care resources, journal articles, presentation slides, and basic of quality improvement information. Great. So there's a lot of support available here. Um, I know that it's a major provider concern to think about, you know, just kind of opening the gate and letting um, all the consumers who are very passionate and sometimes, um, you know, of different levels in terms of whether they feel like an activist or an advocate, you know, um, and we want to really focus more on advocates here um, for these roles. So, so in terms of helping people to get started, um, we have a lot of supportive resources that will become quickly or hopefully soon available on the End Disparities Learning Exchange website. Thanks so much, um, Amir, for providing that recap of um, this presentation. And for those of you who are looking for more information on the Partners in Care roles, we did talk about it extensively on our November 17th webinar um, in the second half of that um, webinar. So you can review the recording later on um, if you're looking for more information. Um, and with that, I'd like to um, invite Dolores to walk us through some ideas for a deeper dive. Um, yeah. If I'm a consumer and I want to engage my provider, how do I do that? So even before we start the deeper, deeper dive, I, we have a small intimate group, and I think I would love to hear from participants on the call, what are some of the action that you think uh, consumers need to, to do to, 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 in your setting? What are some of the things you'd like them to do if they want to engage you as a provider and get you involved, get you to become more involved in consumer involvement? Any ideas? Because most people what? are called the providers, so I'd love to hear from you. I think I heard somebody, go ahead. Well, I see somebody talking, but I can't hear them. You might be on mute. Hello, Dolores? Hello. Yes, Hey, 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 this is Chuck. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make a quick comment. I think um, for, for our program, we have kind of a, a core group of maybe 10 or 15 um, individuals living with HIV and AIDS that do participate in uh, various committees, and we're very grateful for that. Um, however, we know that we're missing a, a huge number of uh, individuals out in the community that don't participate. And so for us, our challenge is really trying to figure out ways to reach out to those those people so that we get a, you know, a complete picture of what's going on across the TGA and so we can, you know, utilize that feedback to guide and direct our quality initiatives. Wow, that is good. Thanks so much. Sure. Anybody else? This is Judy. I'm, I'm not a direct provider. I'm one of the coaches, but one of the sites with which I work um, has something that they hold um, kind of off-site and mm -hmm. so it's related to the clinic, but it's called the Positive Living Room, and it's a way for um, people that work at the clinic and the patients to get together and talk about just general things like the impact of personal time. Um, there could be educational stuff like the life cycle of HIV, um, power of positive relationships, and the leader within you. So, you know, they try to make those topics that strengthen everybody's core skills and create um, a feeling of comfort that it's peer-to-peer -peer in the sense that everybody, you know, is, is important 
for their respective role in this consumer involvement. It's not just consumers taking the initiatives. It's got to be reciprocal. I, I think that's the key, and I think that's one of the things um, we, we, we really have to talk about. It's, it's about uh, the, the both, both the consumer and the provider having reciprocal roles where, you know, um, the, the, the consumer can initiate, but the provider can also initiate. So I'm going to go on to the first slide. Next slide, please. And this is probably pretty much what we've been talking about, you know, how to engage providers in consumer involvement. And here it's saying, you know, talk to your provider. It's really saying to the consumer, talk to your provider about what you want to get involved with. Here it's, you know, asking the consumer to be proactive and to, you know, say, you know, what they want to do and how they want to be involved and kind of what time frame they want to be involved in, um, over and how often or how intensely they want to be involved. This is where, we're, you know, we are, we're asking the consumers to initiate the discussion. Next slide. And Dolores, I think before I move on, I think one of the important things here for consumers to consider about their involvement um, is that that piece about intensity. Um, so many of our programs um, who are trying to, you know, have robust clinical quality management programs with committees and meetings really require a high level of attendance and attentiveness. Um, and so I think that this is something that's really key for consumers to consider and to ask themselves if they can make that type of commitment um, and if they're really interested in becoming um, committed, you know, involved in that level. Um, mentors and spokespeople really have the ability to be a little bit more flexible and, you know, um, you know, kind of come as they are and as they're ready, you know, type of, um, you know, situation as opposed to an architect, which, you know, the, the agency sets up the, the timelines for um, the meetings and participating in um, cabs and whatnot. So it's, it's important to follow, um, to follow that logic there. And, and that is key because at the end of the day, there has to be some amount of assessment, you know. The consumer has to assess their availability and their willingness, and the provider has to assess, is, is this the right person um, for the different roles? And so I totally agree with you that it opens it up for us to have different roles at different times based on the availability or, or the time frame that we do have. Um, next slide, please. There are a number of resources um, available to help both the provider and the consumer to identify and to be involved in their role. So really, as we say, identify and direct their motivations and their passions. So ask your provider if he or she thinks your involvement would further improve health and wellness. More than likely, the answer is yes. And we just need to decide at what level you will do that. Because no matter what level you choose, your involvement is germane to helping us reduce disparities among the populations we've identified. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and I think that um, by having consumers um, approach you as providers, um, it's really a great uh, way to think as a provider about an activated patient and patients who are interested and, and um, compliant with their, with their health care and they're showing and demonstrating this interest in something greater and becoming involved in something greater, you know, it's not as though um, you're not going to have to work with this person over time um, in some way, shape, or form, um, but the idea is that it's not the um, dilemma of endless possibility with regard to your patient population, that here are patients who are proactively approaching you as providers to say, I'd really like some skin in this game. Perfect. So let's dive deeper into the Partner in Plus Care um, uh, campaign and disparities. So we talked a lot about who should be a, who should be a mentor. And, um, you know, Amir talks about um, his role. Um, and maybe, Amir, maybe you could tell us a little bit more, 
about who you see should be a mentor? Okay. So if you're a member of the transgender MSM of color, African American, of Latina women or youth ages 13 to 24 groups, talk with your peers. If you're not a member of one of these groups, you can still try to reach out, but know that your advice and support may not be welcome. And why do we say why do we say that? I think that that's important because some individuals aren't you know always welcoming as to discuss you know their HIV status or aren't comfortable enough to engage with you know their providers. Yeah, because and, and I think that you know as a woman living with HIV. Um, I, I, I feel comfortable talking to other women who have shared experience. Um, but maybe a young woman might not relate well to me. They might relate better to a young woman their age. Um, maybe I will relate much better to older women who are in my age group because then we can talk about all the exciting things about menopause. But, um, <laughs> but that's it, is that you relate well to peers who share your experiences, share similar experiences, and, and therefore you can talk uh, to, to, to these people and you, and you can help each other. I think oftentimes it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a relationship that you help each other. Yeah, I think that's so important. Those are great points, guys. Thank you. So um, uh, as we go on, we say how to get started. As we said before, you talk to your provider, you see if there's anyone there that, you know, they would consider a good match for you as a peer. And we suggest that because, you know, if you're in the clinic setting, your provider have a good sense of the clientele that's there. And it's a comfortable place to start. They're able to say, well, you know, I think you would match up well with so-and-so. And it really does kind of break the ice for you and, and set you up to be successful. But we say safety first, you know. Um, be sure that um, you, you, you know, you, your provider knows this already. Make sure you are not being sent to find people. Um, definitely don't go into anybody's home. Um, you know, the, your job is not an outreach person. It really is just to mentor somebody else in your clinic, helping them to address um, uh, their uh, health outcomes, um, the, the goal, the goal of this program is really to get to good health outcomes, and your role as a mentor is really that to share your experiences and to help somebody on the way. So uh, start first where you are. It's easiest to do this with your family and friends, or with strangers within the clinic environment. Does anyone on the call have any um, other thoughts or advice for folks who are would-be mentors? So if I'm, um, you know, it, it, and you're talking to consumers who might be on the call today, but um, particularly to folks who are watching this recording later, what pointers or what, what tips might you have um, or any insights you might have for folks who would be considering becoming mentors? This is Judy again. I just uh, when I think of mentors in one of the settings, I think a lot of my programs have discussed this almost at like a buddy system, especially at the point of care where people are first linked to care and they may be newly diagnosed or just coming back after a long stay and getting them through those first several appointments and letting them feel like they belong and that and that's like almost like an ambassador, but it is a mentor buddy role. And I think that's a really great place to begin. Great. I agree. Yeah, yeah and this is, this is um, Bubba, um, in our experience in um, rural parts of uh, Florida, and I've, I've heard throughout the other parts of Florida too, is that don't try to necessarily pair up um, um, uh, populations like is you know is the the linkage is the HIV status and not necessarily you know 
whether you have a gay white male with a gay white male or a black MSM with a black MSM, you know, I, I think when you have the one common 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 factor, it works best for us down here. Great point. And that's, you know, we have to evaluate what works best where we are. So um, I, I agree with you, Robert. Every environment requires um, just different assessment of who can be a good mentor for somebody. Well, for me, yes, uh, go ahead. So this is Amir. Um, for me, a great mentor would be someone who actually has walked that same path and, you know, can appeal and relate to others, and you know, just try to really actively engage them and just share their story. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. So the ambassador, the, it's, the ambassador, it's, it's more than the one-to-one -one relationship that we look for as a mentor. This is where you are willing to share your story with a lot of folks. Um, you're willing to stand in that room and really tell about your successes and your challenges. So, you know, you, as an ambassador, you decide what is your story. Do you have something you want to share with the community or other consumers or even beyond that? Do you want to promote the awesome work of your organization, your provider organization, or a group of provider organization um, your provider is connected to? And are you excited to work on disparities? Do you believe the work of your providers or the network uh, will make a dent in disparities for HIV outcome. This is really important because I think a lot of time we talk about disparities, but sometimes we feel we can't do anything about it. But this is the opportunity for us to lend our experience um, to this effort and to probably realize that, yes, we can be that small drop in the ocean that makes a big difference. And so, um, when you, when you think about the role of ambassador, these are some of the things you want to consider. Yeah, no, and I think, you know, when, when I'm at a conference um, and I'm listening to people's stories, you know, um, it's really impactful. It's really powerful. It's very meaningful to be an audience, uh, in the audience, and to see someone, you know, speak from the heart um, about what um, their journey has been and, you know, what they're trying to do and that invitation for others to join them, I think is just very powerful. And as a person living with HIV, um, I think it's been, you know, really gratifying when I'm the person who's sharing my story. You can see on people's faces um, empathy um, and you can feel that um, meaning and wanting um, to connect. And so it's, it's really like um, a windfall. You know, I get the good feeling from sharing my story. Um, I get uh, the feeling that I'm not alone. Um, and I also often get contacts from people saying, hey, how do I get involved in that? And thank you for sharing. I had no idea that XYZ Clinic um, has um, a certain project in place and that they've really seen results, and that's really exciting. So for me, that's been something that's been like a really – really rewarding opportunity or experience um, when I've been an ambassador. And I think that leads right into our next slide that talks about working with others, because that's true. When you stand up in the room and you share your story, you help to mobilize other people, because other people look at you and they say, I can do that too, and I have a story. I have a story of successes and even of challenges that I have overcome. And so that is a, a good way to get others involved as ambassadors in your area, in your community. You can, through this, um, even identify what are the common threads that you can work on across uh, a number of different ambassadors. Because we all bring uh, different stories to the table, and it's a, it's a good way to look at the common threads among all our stories. 
it is worthwhile um, to think even about submitting an abstract at an upcoming conference or training activity to get your story out there. Now, I know this is a hard one, <laughs> <laughs> a hard one, because oftentimes you think, oh, an abstract, I'm not a researcher, but believe it or not, you are able to construct an abstract that looks at, you know, the different aspect of your story and really produce something that you can present effectively at a conference. And really, it is about educating. And when we think about quality improvement, oh, my God, to talk about how, as a consumer, you have been pivotal in helping your clinic to improve the delivery of service, that is a phenomenal abstract that you can submit at any conference. And as uh, Michael says, we have tools and resources to help you to do that. So think about that. It is also worthwhile to work on op-eds, blogs, or social media campaign with others. Does anyone on the call want to share any experiences about what it's been like to be an ambassador for them or in terms of thinking about, um, you know, kind of consumer engagement in this type of role, um, you know, and, and what power that might have for people living with HIV? Michael, I have a question. If yeah. But does the um, training for qu quality, training for consumers and quality address some of these issues in its curriculum as well? Uh, Dolores, I think, could answer that best. She's been one of our seasoned trainers in that program. And I think we should let people know that that, too, is an available great resource for certain candidates that, but, well, you know, it, yeah, well, TCU definitely helps you to become more involved in um, participating in teams and committees, really go through the basics of um, understanding data and becoming comfortable with data. So a lot, okay. of, a lot of the TCQ is really about probably helping you um, at the next level also. How do you become involved in your quality improvement team and your quality improvement committee, and what do you need to know and what steps do you need to take. So yes, I would totally encourage consumers to be involved in one of these training sessions. Absolutely. I think that for me, when I go to a conference, one of the most effective types of presentations um, is when someone has a personal story or an anecdote and it's peppered with other facts. Or the other way around. It's a story or a narrative about facts and, you know, a presentation about, you know, work that's ongoing, and it's peppered with anecdotes that are illustrative of these different, um, these different facts that I'm sharing with you. And um, I know a lot of folks have a lot of concern about data, and they don't feel, you know, as though they're math geniuses. And I, I think that Dolores' point is, is great that um, the TCQ does focus so much on um, understanding data and health numeracy in addition to health literacy that um, it would really help folks who are looking to be ambassadors to beef up their confidence and their skill set in terms of understanding and communicating complicated data. Yes, definitely. So um, architects, um, there's a network in place that your provider organization is already a part of. So you might want to find out about that. I know where I am in New Jersey, there's an ongoing collaborative that uh, providers meet regularly. And it's, it's, it's good if, as a consumer, you want to be involved in that process. Definitely ask your provider about that. There are opportunities to join clinical quality management committees and teams and board associated with those networks. I think on this line, somebody said that they wanted to develop an advisory board. It's good to identify consumers who can become involved in those advisory boards. I particularly like what was mentioned about um, the, uh, I think Judy mentioned it, uh, about uh, uh, people who come together in, 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 a, in a, a, a comfortable environment um, where, where they are, you know, they feel comfortable. 
and the positive living room, this is a good starting point to really develop confidence and to move into more technical work, uh, such as uh, being involved with a team or a committee. And so it's good to identify these things where you are. Um, there are also non-network teams available for you to interface with. So there are many, many opportunities out there. What types of CQM and QI priorities would you raise in the board or committee? Maybe we could ask you that. What are some of the issues that you think consumers might raise in your um, uh, QI committee or team? Just as an example. Anybody? Does anyone have consumers who are um, sitting on an active um, uh, quality management committee or a CAB? And, and what type of questions do they ask? Just to um, provide a couple of examples for folks who might be listening later who are interested in becoming architects. Well, I know where we are. We're, we're, we're trying to collect data on viral suppression rate. And I think that when you look at viral suppression, consumers can be very helpful in um, getting, especially when you think of, of a mentor or even an ambassador or an architect, become very involved in your project around viral suppression to really increase those rates. And so there is a role for consumers, and therefore um, they could represent the views of other consumers on the cab or even on your quality improvement committee. Uh, most recently, uh, two of our consumers sit on our quality improvement committee that was looking at our quality plan for the next three years and really bring that insight uh, to the discussion. So these are some examples of how consumers can become involved um, as architect in your planning and development stage. Yeah, in, in my experience, um, I've worked um, as the director of quality at a Part C clinic in Washington, D.C. called Whitman Walker. And the folks who were members of our cab there were really interested in thinking about um, how experience relates to an outcome. You know, so um, who's greeting people and, and how do you greet them and, and what type of forms are there and how long are those forms and do I have to fill out those forms every time? Um, how about the way that providers talk to patients about certain things? You know, how is um, treatment adherence um, counseling administered at your clinic? And, and what type of um, approaches are taken? Are they culturally competent? Um, are they accessible for all the different populations, particularly the populations who are vulnerable according to your data? Um, you know, we all know that, you know, we might have a viral suppression rate of 80%, but that, you know, transgender people may only have a viral suppression rate of 60%. So how do we communicate or interact with transgender patients in a way that's going to be accessible, meaningful, competent, you know, empowering for them? You know, switching gears and thinking about this more at the network level, um, I've also been involved in the Washington, D.C. Planning Council and in managing the Boston Planning Council years and years ago. And the types of um, questions and concerns that consumers would raise in those settings were more about geographic distribution of resources and how do we make sure that the resources that we're allocating and the types of monitoring that we're doing of agencies within, um, within our networks are really getting at that core issue. It's not that planning councils are involved in monitoring, they're not. That's the grantee's role. However, it is important for us to listen to our consumers and for consumers to come to the table with an open heart and mind in terms of what they can offer to help the, the recipient or the Part A or um, Part B um, recipient to really manage this network of providers that are funded across its area. So those are just a couple of examples from my experience. So just a brief review of the roles. Um, as we said, um, when, you, when you look at partnering plus care, you can see yourself in three uh, distinct roles, mentor with the other individuals, and ambassador for all the good work that 
what you've done and you've achieved in your setting, an architect, uh, the role to help design and implement uh, better care for, for all um, in your environment. Um, so we're, we're going to open it up for a few questions and answers. Um, at this time, I, I must say thank you for being so involved in the discussion thus far. But this is an opportunity for us to answer some of your questions based on what we have covered thus far. And you, your questions can come from either standpoint, um, the consumer standpoint or the provider standpoint. For any of you providers on the line, are there any consumers that kind of stand out in terms of folks with, that you interact with daily or, you know, periodically through providing services who, you know, might fit some of these roles and, um, you know, are there any light bulbs going off for you? You can also put your comment in the box if, if that's comfortable for you also. I know that one of the major questions that people have had is when are these resources going to become available? And we're um, working diligently with our federal partners to make sure that um, they are in tip uh, top condition and um, they should be available soon um, on the website. And again, if you go to um, enddisparitiesexchange.org and click on Partners in Care, you'll see a link soon to the general toolkit and also links to the uh, toolkits for each of the roles within each of the drop downs that are located on that page. Um, so soon, you know, um, but we don't want to rush anything because we, we want to make sure that the resources we provide are the best possible. We are also open to ideas and, uh, uh, and your comments, so please, if you don't do it now, please know that you can always send us a brief email about your ideas and comments, because we really want this to work and really get more consumers even on our webinars. Yeah, I think it would be helpful, you know, even from the provider perspective on, you know, what are some good ways to um, to contact or engage, you know, people that you have your, I want to say your eye on or that you really feel would have a lot to contribute, you know, what are some of the best techniques to provide that warm, you know, uh, successful transfer? That's an awesome question. You know, I, d I don't know, Dolores, if you have any ideas first, I'll let you go first. I have some ideas too. Well, I think one of the big things is that um, for each of these sessions that we have, it would be great if you, you invite one consumer. You know, um, for everybody on the line, if you just brought one person with you, that, that would be a great start um, just to engage. Um, um, I'm trying to send out our notices to planning council member because I'm a planning council member mm -hmm. and to uh, really invite them uh, to join. And I think maybe I have to do a better job of that, of going into their consumer meeting and saying, this is important, you know, become involved. This is how you join. I really think that one-on-one -on -one, um, invitation works really well. Um, flyers work, yes, and announcement work, but one-on-one -on -one really works. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that that's, um, you know, where I was going to go as well, that, you know, um, just letting folks know that this is something that's available as an opportunity, either face-to-face -face or by dropping them a line. Um, sometimes um, by saying, hey, next time you come in, um, I have something that I'd like to talk to you about. I think it could be a really exciting opportunity and something up your alley is a great affirmative way to engage people and um, also demonstrates that, you know, you are thinking about their, their bigger picture involvement in, in some of this work. Um, you know, similar to um, what Dolores had said, I think that 
one of the things that we can do better is making sure that the recordings of all of these, um, you know, are disseminated through our um, consumer networks, including our Facebook networks, um, and that we also tweet about these regularly um, so that folks are more aware of um, the the opportunities um, so that you do have some consumers knocking on your door and it doesn't always feel as provider as though you're trying to, you know, hunt, you know, hunt down the right person um, for participation in this type of activity. I also think it would be a great topic for one of our national TA calls because it's really everybody, something that everybody is, you know, dealing with and, and wants to enhance in their programs. And these are great conversations and, and great tools to think, to think about and ideas. Yeah, I agree. Uh, um, coming back from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement Forum um, this week, um, a number of the most um, compelling presentations, in my opinion, were presentations where consumers um, across the country and in also other countries across the world have really helped to turn um, a medical system or process on its head by, you know, saying, I can do my own dialysis or, you know, I'm maybe nine years old, but I can do my own nightly intubation for um, nutrition. Um, you know, there's a number of different ways that, you know, um, consumers can really get involved, in, and when they do get involved in that way, that there can be, you know, marvelous change and advancement. Um, you know, all these things that I just mentioned sound very scary to most of us on this line probably, um, but that, you know, the results in each of these different um, examples that were provided at the IHI forum, you know, uh, the uh, outcomes increased by double um, in terms of um, increasing in the positive direction. Um, they were usually double um, successful, um, and also the morbidity um, dropped by at least uh, 30 to 50 percent. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, what types of errors and what types of um, other kind of incidental issues arise when, when we try to treat people. So just something to think about. Hmm. So we only have um, about a minute left. Um, I want to bring your attention to um, upcoming conversations. Uh, this is the last of our kickoff events for this initiative. Um, in December, where we're really trying to think about how consumers can work in teams to end disparities um, alongside their providers. Um, each of the next four months is going to be focusing on one of our four focus populations, starting with transgender health in January, um, MSM of color health in February, African American and Latina women health in March, and then youth health in April. Um, by the end of this initiative, May um, and June, we're going to be looking at um, dissemination, um, sustainability, and spread. Each of these red um, um, uh, dates are clickable links that will take you right to the webinar information um, on our website. And um, um, it may not be clickable within the WebEx environment, but the slides that are available for download for free on our website are. Um, our general webinars follow the same schedule. Um, they occur one week before our um, our partners in care roundtables. Um, so we have an opportunity to listen to overall trends and research and themes and then bring it back and, and um, think more concretely as consumers in terms of how we can become meaningfully engaged in this work. Um, for office hours, tomorrow we have an office hours on tools, um, interventions, and our experience. We're going to be looking at uh, different um, um, evidence-based uh, interventions that we found in the literature or through conversations with um, key informants within um, the HIV service system. Um, and on December 16th, we're going to be looking at ShareLab, and Ms. Judy um, on the line and I are going to be um, providing a little bit of an overview of um, what is ShareLab and how to, to use ShareLab, how to register, how to enter information, and how to make comment in addition to having a conversation um, among participants of what types of information they're looking for so we can help them access it and have a clear understanding of, of what this tool is and how to leverage it. And, um, you know, I don't know, um, Dolores or Amir, if you have any closing reflections or remarks to make before we end today's call. I, I am I, I am really really vested in galvanizing and having more consumer engagement. I think partnering fair is a clear tool 
that can help us to get there. But uh, we, we, we've got to share this knowledge as wide as we can and invite as many consumers as we can. So I want to thank you all for joining this call, for being so engaged in consumer in, in engagement and involvement um, with, with N plus disparities campaign, learning exchange. So thank you so much. And excuse my voice, I have a cold that I'm trying to get over. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dolores. Drink hot tea. <laughs> Amir, any comments from you? Um, just to piggyback off of what Dolores said, uh, yes, and engaging the consumers is very important, and it's the only way that we're going to be able to end disparities and, you know, just bring about a conversation. Great. Thanks. And, you know, just to sign off from the National Quality Center, thank you so much for joining us today and for your attention. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing you on an upcoming End Disparities Learning Exchange call. Thanks so much for all you do, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Have thank a great you. day, everyone. Bye. You too. Bye.